It's now my pleasure to introduce Steve Coonan, who you've heard about all through the day. If you think about various roles, we have Dr. Coonan, the eminent physicist, whose work with the laboratory began a long time ago, both as a theoretical physicist, but also coming to the laboratory, as he said in the earlier events, to visit us and provide his advice and counsel to how to build uh, the foundation that has become the foundation for Ephraim. He was an eminent and impeccable academic leader, scholar, but turned into an administrator, so I knew Steve as provost at Caltech uh, when we both began to lose our way from real work uh, and uh, began our administrative career. And I can tell you within that set of people, when Steve had observations and comments, they were extraordinarily insightful and people listened. That's not always true of a provost, so I want to, <laughs> 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 particularly in a set of provosts. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it, so it was. Steve was an extraordinarily valued and valuable colleague, and I appreciate your friendship over the years. He moved on to serve as a chief scientist for BP, the British Energy Company, and then we were very fortunate when President Obama asked him to serve for the Department of Energy in its role as Under Secretary. I can say from uh, meetings at the AAU presence and others, we were sitting around trying to think about who would be a really terrific person to, to lead the science agenda for the Department of Energy. Steve's name always came up because of extraordinary intellect and insight and, and skills in, in working through complex systems and also a sense of values. And people said, no, nah, he'd never do that. <laughs> he has this great job at BP. <laughs> but we're really fortunate that he's chosen to serve his country. And I want to know I serve his country in this role and serve all of us in leading the science agenda. Professor Kuhn. So I, I am, as Luana said, um, from the Department of Energy these days. And so I, I do want to talk about energy and its relation to science and the broader societal scene. Energy presents serious challenges that go to the heart of national prosperity and security. I think those challenges can be addressed, but it's going to require a deep understanding of those problems, wise choices in solutions, and then long-term, vigorous, consistent pursuit of those solutions. So what I want to do is, is to start out by analyzing the problem, outlining it for you a little bit, talk about the kind of solutions that can be implemented and what the administration is doing about them. I've chosen to talk relatively informally and without charts, uh, knowing that you're all just after a wonderful lunch, uh, and it's uh, not quite mid-afternoon, but, uh, but, and also in part really because of the challenge of trying to paint this picture rather simply so that we don't need uh, eye charts at all. It is really a rather simple picture. I think if you ask most of the serious scholars of energy, they would agree as to what the problems are and what the palette of solutions are at kind of the 90 to 95 percent level. The real challenge is to get enough understanding in the public and in the decision makers and enough political will so that we can start to implement these uh, challenges. So let me talk about the problems a little bit first. And the first thing to understand is that energy is essential for economic development and prosperity. We need it for manufacturing, we need it in buildings for heat and light, and we need it for mobility. We in the developed world, the OECD countries, about a billion people out of seven in the world right now as a whole, have a relatively high use of energy per capita, but it's growing pretty slowly in all of the developed countries. The developing world, however, needs energy in order to develop, and you see the energy use rising rapidly in the developing world per capita. Right now, China uses per person about one-seventh of the energy that the US does. And of course, as China develops, given all of the historical examples we have of societal development, 
they and other countries in the developing world will be using more energy. Right now, about half of the world's energy is used in the OECD, in the billion people in the developed world, and about half in the rest of the world. And of course, the OECD use is relatively constant. The rest of the world is going up rapidly. About 25 years from now, we're going to see an increase in energy demand, if nothing changes, of about 50%. So we're going to need 50% more energy in 2035 than we're using right now. And by about the middle of the century, we're going to need twice as much energy as we're using right now. And of course, we need to be able to provide that energy in a reliable and environmentally responsible way. So it is an enormous challenge. 